this is all based on the same laws that Bohr used to account for the energy states of electrons in, in atoms. Uh, uh, this gives a few uh, ideas. Uh, is, that, is that legible to you? So the, the, the main things we need are that uh, the, the ultimate building blocks of matter are made up of identical particles, uh, electrons, which have a spin one half and obey Fermi Dirac statistics, or bosons, uh, particles of don't have a spin. Uh, which obey Bose-Einstein statistics. Helium atoms, for example, have a zero spin. Electrons have a spin one half and uh, obey Fermi-Dirac statistics. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. You, the, everything would collapse. shows the basic equations we'll need later when we talk about uh, macroscopic uh, objects. Uh, the uh, the Broglie uh, quantum relation between momentum and wavelength. In quantum theory, matter has aspects of waves as well as particles. And the relation is given, but the momentum is h over the wavelength of the wave. Uh, the Bohr quantum condition is that the uh, line integral of the momentum uh, around a loop is uh, a multiple integral multiple of Planck's constant h. For example, if you for a circular orbit that means 2 pi r uh, times the momentum is equal to h, or the momentum is equal to h over 2 pi r. Uh, if you have uh, waves, there must be something waving, uh, uh, and that's the uh, Schrodinger wave function, uh, uh, which is a complex quantity from which you derive things about the real world, uh, but it in itself uh, is a, uh, you can think of as a computational object or well, whatever you, you, your philosophy is. And it's uh, probably, as you all know, many people have worried about the uncertainty brought about by quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics just gives the probability of events happening and don't tell you what, uh, uh, what, what path the particle followed or, or uh, th things of that sort. Uh, and uh, and uh, from the quantum uncertainty relations, there uh, questions you shouldn't ask anyway. So the uh, wave function gives you all the information you really need to uh, predict the results of experiments and uh, understand what goes on in the world. The uh, I think that's about all I need there. So we'll go on to the slides. I'll first uh, talk about uh, 
perhaps the simplest system, have the first slide. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to push something here. Maybe better to darken the... On the left shows the energy levels in a semiconductor. Uh, the valence band uh, is the re uh, uh, corresponds to the states for the electrons, uh, which make up the valence bonds, which bond the uh, material together. In the semiconductor, there's a, an energy gap where there no allowed states in the ideal material, and then another uh, uh, band of possible states which are normally unoccupied. If you heat the semiconductor to high temperature, you can excite electrons from the occupied valence bonds into the conduction band, and uh, uh, then you get what's called intrinsic conductivity, as indicated on the right. You have uh, mobile holes, and uh, which correspond to missing electrons from the valence band, and uh, mobile electrons of negative charge. Uh, if you um, shine light of sufficient to high enough frequency, you can also get conductivity. That's photoconductivity. Uh, what Bratton, Shockley, and I discovered is another way of increasing the conductivity or controlling the conductivity in a semiconductor. That is by current flow from an appropriate contact or junction, uh, such, for example, a something which will introduce electrons from one side and holes from the other and apply a voltage, you can control the, or increase the conductivity. That's the uh, transistor effect. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> Semiconductor lasers are now uh, widely used. They're in your supermarket checkout. They're in compact disks. They're in laser printers. Uh, you can find them practically everywhere. And the principle is indicated on uh, this slide, uh, taken from a by Nick Holniak from the University of Illinois. And it, um, if you uh, inject carriers, you got a high conductivity, they tend to recombine. And uh, in certain semiconductors, they recombine by emission of light of a wavelength approximately equal to the band gap. Uh, if the a semiconductor is a, in the form of a cavity. There will be many possible normal modes for the electromagnetic uh, radiation of the, uh, from the recombination of the electrons and holes that are injected. Uh, <clears throat> what is shown in the small diagram in the upper right corner is a uh, 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 plot A, uh, where the uh, uh, shows that the radiation is in a wide band of uh, frequencies or wavelengths. Uh, this plots the intensity of the light, and by just increasing uh, the uh, current a little bit, they go up to point B. And then shown on a scale about 100 times smaller, you'd have to blow it up 100 times to get it on the same scale as the other. Uh, you see almost all of the intensity is just in one frequency. That's macroscopic occupation of a single frequency. And that comes from stimulated 
emission as uh, the emission probability is proportional to the number of photons present in the quantum state. Uh, as the number increases, the probability of radiation into that quantum state increases. So you get what's called a super linear increase in light intensity uh, with current flow. And you can see that uh, the big increase comes from the big increase just in the one mode. And that's what I mean by macroscopic occupation of a uh, single quantum state. The same uh, sort of principle applies to helium atoms uh, in uh, superfluid helium. Uh, in this case, the uh, energy uh, states are, are discrete, determined by the uh, boundary conditions of the uh, states in a macroscopic system are very close together, but still uh, discrete, still shows the effect of statistics on the occupation. For electrons, which obey Fermi-Dirac statistics and the exclu exclusion principle, you can only put one electron of one spin orientation in a given state. So in a typical metal, you have to fill up a very large number of states uh, up to the, what's called the Fermi level. And then at high enough temperature, you could excite states from the uppermost levels into higher states. And that shows what happens in typical metal. In classical Boltzmann statistics, uh, you get a distribution uh, of this sort. But with Einstein-Bose statistics, you can have a macroscopic occupation. You can have a large number of particles in one quantum state, just as you can have a large number of photons in one uh, uh, one quantum state in the in the laser. It's when you get macroscopic occupation that you get the remarkable superfluid properties. Uh, this shows uh, what you have. If they have a non-interacting system, just a system of helium particles, uh, not, not interacting with one another, then at the, at the t equals zero, uh, they would all be at the lowest energy state, 100%. Uh, as a result of the interactions between them, uh, only about 10% are in the zero momentum state. To, the rest are in a distribution uh, above that. If you, it's when uh, the, the superfluid properties occur uh, when a fr fraction of the uh, particles are in one momentum state at rest, it would correspond to the state uh, uh, P equals zero. As you increase the temperature, uh, the uh, occupation decreases and goes to zero at what's called the lambda point, uh, where the uh, 